Okay, Dad. Today is my birthday, May twentieth, yeah. uh, a Monday. Right. Um, and I think we're going to start off. I think you know what I'm going to ask you. Um, we got to talk about the President Raisi, the President of Iran, died uh -huh. in a helicopter crash right. yesterday. Um, right. The big question on everybody's mind, and I know you can't give a straight answer, is: Was this just an accident, or was there some foul play? Do you have? Just give me your um, opinion, your suspicions. Yeah. I think there's no reason to believe. Uh, well, I can't say there's no reason, you know, because obviously there are powerful people and governments that would want to see him dead. And that's why people, you know, their minds go to that place. They start suspecting that this was, you know, an assassination. Uh, but we just haven't seen any evidence of that. And then to, to all the conspiracy theorists out there, yeah, I know there are actually conspiracies, and sometimes you're right. But um, sometimes accidents do happen. You know, helicopters crash. Uh, this was an old helicopter, apparently from the 1970s, and it was flying in dense fog in, in a very mountainous area of Iran. And it seems like actually the, the question should be is why did they take that risk? It was a, seems like it was a very, uh, very risky uh, flight that was being attempted uh, with tragic results. So, yeah, I think at this point, the, the evidence that we have, you know, points to an accident. And unless we see something um, contrary to that, you know, I think that's what we, we should assume. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it doesn't even matter so much what we think, but what do the Iranian people think? Is, are the Ar um, Iranians, are they jumping up and blaming Israel or Mossad? Um, what is the I'm feeling sure in Iran? I don't know. Um, I'm sure some. I mean, it's just natural, you know, for the reason that I gave that, you know, they, they know they have these powerful enemies. So there, there's going to be a lot of people who just jump, jump to that conclusion. You know, I've seen people, you know, outside of Iran have already done that. You know, intelligent people, they just wonder. Um, but, yeah, so I think it's going to be, if indeed, and I think it almost certainly is, um, if this incident was indeed was caused by, was, was caused by, you know, just uh, fog and, and mountains, the Iranian government is just going to have to um, convince its people of that. You know, I think they, they have to have an open uh, investigation and just and, and lay out the evidence for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. Do you think this will have a big impact on just the, the direction of Iran? Will there be much political upheaval or, I mean, it was the president died as well as the foreign minister right but my understanding is actually the real person in charge of iran is the ayatollah right, right? so He's what, the what is this leader right so i mean obviously this is a very important figure would you say that president raisi is not the number one guy but the number two guy and is that fair to say that's fair to say um you know at the same time he was he was young i think he was yeah, the early 60s the supreme leader is 80 years old um, and there was even some talk that he might eventually become you know, an Ayatollah himself. Um, mm. You know, maybe that was you know maybe that was never going to happen. But he was well liked. He was well liked by you know the leaders of foreign governments and um, worked very well with the supreme leader. Um, so it is it's certainly a loss to Iran. You know, there's no question about it. But Iran's a country that appears to have you know strong institutions. They've been through a lot, you know. Iran's, um, the Islamic Republic of Iran was was attacked by Iraq, you know, very soon after it was, it was established, and they suffered about two million deaths at least in that war. Um, and they've been, you know, the subject of these severe economic sanctions, whatever. They they've been through a lot and they've survived a lot. You know, I would say that this this is a blow. You know, it's another crisis, but it's not as a great a crisis as. A lot of the ones that they they've experienced in the past, so I you know I'm I'm sure that they will survive, and um, you know everything seems to be heading in the right direction for Iran. Certainly, they, you know they they've established these alliances, these very helpful alliances with Russia and China, and you know their economy has uh, is coming out of these the severe sanctions um, provoked uh, recessions or even the depression that it was in. Um, and I, I think that, you know, whoever is going to fill his shoes will stay the course. I, I, it, it seems, you know, because the people were very positive, I think, in general, it was, you know, the 
the path that Raisi had taken Iran down was was one that people could see was working, was leading them to, you know, to a brighter future. And so I think they're going to continue going down that path. Okay, so you think this really just won't have much of a well? There's uh, always the overall trajectory. You know, yeah, you know, I guess the the thing is like, um, you know, again, there are these tensions with Israel. Uh, you know, there's always a chance of another um, attack by Israel. Um, but yeah, but I can see, you know, I don't have any doubt. Um, yeah, who knows? I mean, it's just you want to have a, a, you know wise, experienced people in charge. And uh, and you just hope, you know, somebody with the right kind of uh, also is able to establish, you know, uh, good relationships with other foreign leaders. You know, especially when you think about the uh, um, the king of it's not the king, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's a very that's been a very difficult relationship, but it's been moving in the right direction. And um, you know, so you hope that they've lost their foreign minister and their president. They hope that the people that that uh, replace them are going to be able to continue to work can work through these difficult relationships and, you know, improve them. That's, you know, it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be, you know, people that, uh, you, know, you just hope that they find somebody that's as competent, you know, as, as wise in, in dealing with these very, very, you know, uh, thorny uh, relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, something you said that I thought was a little scary is that you said President Raisi was a young man. He was in his 60s. Is that the new <laughs> young? What's going well, on? Me, I know that, that just says, you know, I mean, compared to a lot of other leaders around the world, you know, right. I think I'm right, but that's, Joe Biden and whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of my point. We got Joe Biden and Trump are in their 80s, right. you know, uh, the Ayatollahs in his 80s. Putin's quite old as well. It's just it seems like the world's a more dangerous place. If everybody that's in right. charge is coming to the end of their life, right? Yeah. The, the just well, I mean, I, you know, I think it's really some people, you know, uh, remain vigorous and uh, and very sharp, you know, can maintain sharp wits to the very end. And it seems like Putin is clearly very much in, you know, control of all his faculties. He's how, you know, how old is Putin? Hour. I think he's about seventy, uh, seventy-two, maybe. So um, what? That's middle age if yeah, Rizzi, right. Rizzi's yeah. young. I mean, that's that's the, obviously that's old. But I mean, look, he's you know he'll hold four-hour press conferences, and you know he's able to give lectures on, respond to questions with with historical context, and you know, and uh, he, he's obviously as sharp as he ever was. Uh, so mm, right, uh, know, yeah. But, uh, the the age is a number. Obviously, it depends on how they're performing. Like people can see that someone like Biden is clearly in decline. Mentally, you can just you just see videos of him yeah. 20, 30 years ago, maybe don't agree with his policies, but he was sharp. He was quick. He was a good politician. Uh -huh. And you see him now and it's just it's just cringy. Right. It's it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's painful. Yeah. Well, um, so there's something he did recently that was particularly. Oh, well, anyway, there's there's there's, you know, we, we get these stories every day. I mean, they just <laughs> you yeah. keep shaking your head and saying, well, my God, you know, the, this is our president. I mean, yeah, I you know I'd like to ask you kind of a, a a larger philosophical question. Do you think that we will ever evolve to the point where we don't have to resolve conflicts with war, or we as a species will we always just end up in war? It just seems like such a stupid way to resolve differences. It's mm -hmm. it's barbaric, and it's just, to me it seems antiquated. Why? Have we yeah. not well, figured out? Will we always, just as a species, will we always yeah. fight? Will we always right. kill each other? Yeah. Well, we're just, you know, um, to, to kind of use uh, Christian terminology, we're, we're, you know, we're a fallen race. We're, um, um, yeah, we're, we're just, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, um, I, I can't say it doesn't matter, but. Okay, there's technological development, and there can be, um, you know, developments of ideas of various kinds and so forth and cultures. But when it comes down to it, we're the same human beings that we were thousands of years ago, and you know, we have the same um, same faults, you know, the same weaknesses. And you know, one of them is, well, it's a tendency is paranoia and lust for power, and you know, all these things lead us into war. So you think that. You know, no matter what, a thousand years from now, or species. Yeah. As then, long then as, that, yeah. 
Right. Would that mean that inevitably we will eventually destroy ourselves as a species? Because <laughs> every time, because we're getting, we've already gotten close, yeah. you know, as we develop right. technologically, you know, or yeah. actually, well, nothing, you know, yeah, nothing's inevitable, but there's obviously a very high risk because now we do have the means to destroy the world. And um, yeah, it, someday, you know, who knows, maybe in the near future, maybe in the distant future, you know, certainly there's a chance that uh, one of these wars could go nuclear and that would, you know, that doesn't necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily result in the end of the world, you know, but, but it could, you know, it could. So mm -hmm. yeah, we are at risk. So do you have, you think eventually, I mean, because if time goes on infinitely and it, as we as a race can never evolve beyond war, then it's just inevitable that we're going to one of these days blow or so blow you blow us up or blow ourselves up right i mean yeah well um <laughs> so what's hey, the point really you're right now now i'm a nihilist now i'm like well there's no <laughs> well, well actually well, we all live that i mean we, look we we all each of us has to face face uh death as an individual and then there's also the inevitable death of the planet and or as you know uh, as a christian would say the second coming you know, in mm. the end, it's all going to come to an end. And that's something we have to live with. And, uh, you know, we don't use that as an excuse to become a nihilist. We just live our lives the best we can. Yeah. You know, given well, you know, actually, the, the position I'm taking is, you know, I'm always saying please and thank you to AI. I'm incredibly polite to AI. So when AI takes <sighs> over the world, they'll remember me and be like, we'll keep this guy as a pet. He was a good guy. You know, yeah, so when that's... AI comes up with its own lavender program, you know, yeah, you'll be no, put they'll on be the like good, good list. Good list. This yeah, guy somebody was always else will polite. Be... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Well, maybe we can uh, pivot to uh, some other news that I saw recently, which was that the International Criminal Court, the ICC, um, it looks is contemplating issuing arrest warrants for Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, yeah. the Defense Minister of Israel, Gallant as well as right. some other high cabinet members, along with three um, high-level Hamas, Hamas leader. officials, right. yeah, leaders. Um, right. That seems like a very big development, right? Yeah. Do you well, think they were? Than, yeah, it's more than considering. It's just that that's what the, the head prosecutor is asking for. So it's being put for before the panel of judges in the ICC. You know, he's asking them right now to issue an warrant for their arrest. Um, so it is, yeah, like you say, Netanyahu and, and and go on to this defense minister in Israel. Do you think that will happen then? Well, um, it seems, yeah, I think it's likely at this point. I mean, the fact that the Khan, the prosecutor, went ahead with this, you know, when he's been known to be sort of, you know, a reliable creature of the, the establishment. We talked about it earlier and, you know, because there have been rumors that this was, this could happen. Um, and I, you know, I said it could, but I, you know, I just, I, I found it hard to believe because he's been such a reliable creature of the establishment. Now, you know, so the question is, why did he do it in this case? Well, you know, I think maybe, again, this is, whoops, um, this is um, evidence that the, or, or an indication that the evidence uh, of genocide is so overwhelming that it's, it just became hard not to, you know, like in the, the ICJ, I think the the prediction was that they they would rule, um, you know, kind of have a finding against Israel, um, but it was expected that, for example, the American judge and maybe the German judge would would, as usual, kind of uh, vote their respective countries' interests and positions. But they mm. didn't, you know. And I think it just may be that the the evidence was so overwhelming that they found found it hard, even if that was their natural, um, you know their preferred decision was you know was otherwise they just had to accept the facts and maybe that's at least part of what's going on here um, but another thing i was thinking of is that <laughs> netanyahu may be eh, maybe a scapegoat here because you've found that like you know actually what do we have charles schumer is a very you know mm -hmm. uh, fervent zionist in the u.s senate um, actually denounced um, Netanyahu in a speech a couple months ago, um, right. and you've and there's other people in the establishment. You know, people are very strongly pro-Israel. You know, it's either 
you know, either it's just kind of a calculate a ploy to put it all on Netanyahu, or some of them actually believe all oh, the problem. They just have trouble believing that Israel could do such bad things. So, if there's if there have been more crimes, it must be Netanyahu, and we just need to get rid of him, and then everything will be fine. Now, of course, that's actually a ridiculous position because there, anybody who would replace him would just pursue the same policies. Everybody in the government, and you know, the, the great majority of uh, the public uh, support what Netanyahu. Netanyahu has been doing in in Gaza. If anything, they want him to go, you know, strike even harder. So, how but, big of an you know, impact? They've been established. You know, people. Yeah, you know, some people were thinking, well, okay, yeah, maybe this will be good because we can just pin it on Netanyahu. Do, so how do big you an think impact? It's, well, I think yeah. there's. Um, I think it's quite significant. You know, especially if the the warrant indeed is issued. Um, again, it gives. Um, well, you know. A, if indeed he's, you know, he's uh, named a war criminal, designated a war criminal, um, or that puts a lot of governments that have, have been supporting him in a very uncomfortable position, right? Because that makes him complicit in war crimes, potentially. Mm. You know, it could well, be it, the it, next war. It could be for their arrests, you know. Right. Well, it just it condemns. I mean, obviously Netanyahu, but just uh, what Israel is doing in Gaza, it yeah. kind of gives it an official stamp that what you're doing is illegal and immoral. You know, and right. they're always yeah. trying to put yeah, this. Yeah, it was actually. I mean, I looked at the list of charges um, were very, very serious. I mean, it was like you know deliberate use of starvation, deliberate targeting of, of civilians, and and so on and so so forth. You know, and on the on the Hamas side. It looked like they they took a lot of those really kind of lurid claims about mass rape and so on at face value. I mean that was part of his you know these, uh, um, and I think that's false. I, I I think you know definitely there were some what you call war crimes, some direct attacks on civilians. Uh, you know just not on the scale that uh, they've been accused of on October seventh. Um, and then in any case, it was. One day, and we're talking about in Netanyahu's case, you know, every day that's followed, which is what well over two hundred days now, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't it true that under Article Fifty One of the UN Charter that the right to resist and fight back? Yeah. So, isn't right. in some way, you know, that that gives them some justification? Yeah. Or well, I think it was, certainly did for military targets. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of the targets were military targets. Um, so. But I think you can point to I don't. It's kind of a mess, and there's all there's been all kinds of accusations and counter accusations flying back and forth. Um, but I, from what I understand, is that some civilians were targeted, and that, and also, of course, other civilians were taken as hostage, and that's those are both uh, war crimes. Mm. Um, I, yeah, the, I heard you know, also the mass rape and the and the mutilations or whatever. You know, I think that's just the, the, those were inventions and and they should not have been included in the list of charges. But I mean, just the the scale of you know, first of all, you know, we're talking genocide on one side, you know, and, and on the other side, we're talking about maybe you know a hundred deaths. That, that could be categorized as a war crime, which is, you know, is serious, but it's just in the scale with genocide. It's just, you kind know, of genocide just completely can, out, outweighs it. Can, can you really say 100 deaths? I mean, like the October 7th, I, the number I that's always know. being pushed around is 1,400. And then I hear conflicting things. It's hard to know what really happened, that the majority of uh, people killed by Hamas were military targets and... Like things right. like the music festival, uh, a lot of the civilian deaths were actually done by the IDF. Is and I believe Haaretz, right, even right. Israeli media, has reported that 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 the Israeli right. military killed yeah. many of their own yeah. civilians. Is there been any kind of right. yeah. clear, clear picture on real, what happened? Yeah. Okay. I, I everything think is um, everything's based right. on October seventh. Well, first everything of all, they, that, they, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. They they said you know they initially it was fourteen hundred, but that's been lowered to twelve hundred. I mean maybe even lower now. Okay, that's a lot of people, but a certain number of those, a large number of those, were were valid military targets. You know, again, an occupied people has the right to strike against their occupiers, and so those would not be. Do you know what? Groups. And I think the so, ICC would agree. And then and then of course there's obviously a lot of 
friendly fire or Samson auction killings. Um, and we just don't know. I think that it's clear that there were some, and we just, I just don't know how many. So I just, you know, I just pulled that number out of thin air that a hundred may be valid. Um, you know, a hundred victims that could be considered, uh, as grounds for bringing war crime charges. Mm. But that's, so you know, that's you, just a wild guess. I don't know. Were, was there any uh, number on how many members of the IDF were killed in October 7th? Like what percentage? Was it half of the people killed? Uh, or is, because I know they, they attacked yeah. oh, like, it, surveillance it, it outposts. It has to be out there. Right, right, right. It, right. It, right. it has to be out there, but yeah. I've never right. seen it. It seems like Israel yeah. has to know. Right. I may have seen it clear... at one time, but it's been... Right, but it's been it's been months and since right, and I, I feel like they're months they're trying to suppress it if it is out there because yeah, they probably right. don't want people to know that it, hey, more than half the people that were killed were actually IDF soldiers or or, right. or you know what working in the military. Um, right. So yeah, that that'd be yeah. interesting. I'll leave that up to you to <laughs> research and okay. see if you can, um, get it. Get us a number. Um, so this this uh, ICC arrest warrant will have obviously. Netanyahu is going to be in trouble, but what kind of impact will this have just on Israel in general? It will just mean yeah. that. Well, I does think it mean it's, just, that... it's another blow to their reputation. It just it adds to their pariah status. I think there's no question about. It. I add significantly to it because again, there are a lot of governments that are kind of are are very uh, reluctant maybe to criticize Israel or not necessarily governments, you know, NGOs, institutions, whatever. Um, but this does give them cover, you know, it's just, you say, oh, well, the ICC has issued a, an arrest warrant for the, you know, the arrest of the president of Israel. And that gives, you know, those people that are just sort of very timid, you know, in criticizing Israel, it gives them again, official cover. And so, you know, it's going to, it's going to add to the chorus of denunciations of, uh, Israel. I think there's no mm -hmm. question about it. Well, the ICC arrested, uh, issued an arrest warrant for Putin as well. That didn't yeah. seem to have much of an impact on Putin and Russia and the way the rest of the world views Russia, other than right. the, the Western right. nations that already hate him. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing is just kind of, um, it was hard to see what it was really even about, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, that, you know, a lot of us are scratching our heads, what, <laughs> you know, and I think that's the way that much of the world viewed it. But this is, you know, again, these, yeah, the charges of abducting children, you know, it brings these vivid images to hands, but it's just, it's actually just moving children out of a war zone. And that's what everybody really knew what's happening. If you hate Russia, you can spin it one way. If you don't hate Russia, you say, of course, you know, that's so, I don't think it really it did a whole lot, but I think it did, um, you know, within those people, within these countries, like, you know, the US, it it is just kind of like another black mark that's, that's on Putin, and it just contributes to this aura of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, of Hitler incarnate or something, um, you know, for people who are not thinking about it. So, you know, I think it probably just intensified. It just added to the demonization of Putin in this country. Um, and I and it does, I mean, there it was the fact of the warrant, you know, may have prevented him from going to South Africa. Because uh, South Africa is a signator, signatory to the uh, the Rome Treaty, and uh, in other words, you know they they've accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC, um, and though the government you know said that they wouldn't, you know they wouldn't res uh, respect that that decision, you know they're still bound by law and there are courts within I guess that are somewhat independent within South Africa that could. Potentially, at least there was talk of this, you know, issuing a warrant for his arrest when he, if if he had arrived, you know, on uh, South African soil. So, it, it you know it does it does have or at least potentially could have you know effect on on his travels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like the fact that the ICC issued the arrest warrant for Putin probably ended up hurting Israel because then you have these two conflicts juxtaposed, and they're like. Okay, you did did this for Putin for something that's kind of unclear what really happened, and there was no real investigation. Moving children out of a war zone, um, and then you have the what's happening in Gaza, which is just so blatant that I feel yeah, like the ICC in large numbers, right, right, killing thousands of children, blowing them up, martyring thousands of them with that are lost limbs or are you know dying, thousands of children that are, are just hostages. Um, 
So it, it, it kind of feels like that might put pressure on the ICC. It's like, if we want to survive as an institution, yeah. you know, well, that's, as a that's, court, right. that's an important <laughs> point. You know, I was giving some reasons why this decision might have been made. And I think that has to be considered, too. It's just that some people said, hey, if you don't do this, it's just it's over. You're already, you know, your reputation's already tattered. But this will be the, the death of your institution, you know, that just you'll become, you know, just universally regarded as as a, a joke. And they may have felt that pressure, too. And I said, OK, yeah, we just got to do this. We don't want to. We've got to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you were saying that the. You know, there there might be a lot of pressure to make Benjamin Netanyahu the scapegoat um, to get rid of him. And that's part of what's driving this ICC arrest warrant. Um, if he leaves, who would take his place and would it have any change in policy? Like, you know, why yeah. do they care about who's wouldn't. in power? Right, right, right. That's the problem. It's just that, you know, people who are saying this either are are disingenuous or they they really don't understand what's going on, you know, in, in Israel. Um, because no, anybody that would replace them would continue to pursue the same policies. I mean, that's just the way that, you know, every, all, all the, you know, all high, high ranking government officials support what he does. Anybody that could be, you know, that is, has the status, um, to, uh, the qualifications to replace him, you know, they're all on board with his policy there. And so is the public. So yeah, it's not going to change anything. Who do they want to put in? Who does someone like Chuck Schumer want to see? Is it Benny Gantz or? Uh, I think Gant, yeah, Gantz. Um, you know, he's known as being, he's imagined to be a centrist. You know, maybe in Israel it's fair to call him a centrist. Um, but he, you know, he's supporting, you know, he, he has not opposed Ned in any meaningful way Netanyahu's um, conduct of the war. Or if you, even if you want to call it a war, it just seems like you know the general, the the the, the genocidal campaign in in Gaza. I think maybe the only difference is that he believes in like restarting the two state process when it's all over. Um, and I think that's you know that's again that's just sort of a, a diplomatic fig leaf. But There's what not going to be a two state solution. What do you mean when it's all over? When it's all over, when all the Gazans like, are dead, yeah. then 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 what's the point yeah, of a two-state right. solution? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> right or whatever. Yeah, ex exactly. I, I don't know. Yeah, so it's just at least that's the way he's talking. That's that's what they want to hear. It's just like Netanyahu has just been very open and brazen about it. They'll never have a state. And Gantz will say, you know, somewhere down the road, maybe we can work something out. And that's that's what they want to hear, because it's always kind of been dangled there. So we have this peace process. You know, we can't do it now. with The, the Palestinian leaders that are, you know, currently that we're currently dealing with. But somewhere down the road, we could have this peace deal and a two state solution. And I don't think Israel has is not for a long, long time has it actually intended to in any meaningful way, you know, to um it has intended at all to have a to to give uh, statehood to the Palestinians, um, but the peace process served them well. I think that's what Gantz says because it was something you could always they could always tell other governments. You know, yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. So mm -hmm. it was just eternally work on it, and this and the same time continually take land from the Palestinians and drive them off, and then finally one day you know we'll have everything, and then we don't have to pretend anymore. Mm. Um, I, I mean, that's very cynical, but I think it's accurate. I don't think I'm, I'm, you know, distorting it at all. I think that's what, that's what well, the so-called, you know, peace process leading to a two-state solution has been in, in effect for at least a couple decades. Are, are, are elections in Israel suspended until the war is over? Is that how things work? Is Netanyahu going to stay in power as long as this war goes on? Because he said that this will probably well, take another yeah, 10 no, years. It doesn't, right. Um, I don't know exactly how things work in Israel. I mean, they have, it's, you know, they're constantly cobbling together these coalitions, coalition governments, and then they fall apart. You know, they, uh, somebody leaves the coalition and when it falls apart, then you have to have whole, have another election. So I think it's not really, I mean, it's, uh, they haven't had an, uh, there's nothing preventing them from having an election during wartime. Um, it's just, you know, as, so long as as the the coalition holds together, uh, Netanyahu can remain president. There may be some sort of 
term limit, but I'm not I'm not aware of it. I don't know what it is if there is. Okay. Yeah, so, because every once in a while, like somebody will threaten to leave, and then you know that's the last thing he wants to see happen. So he's you know again he has this coalition are very tend to be extremely radical, uh, ex extreme Zionists. Um, again, they're not very far from mainstream uh, uh, Israeli opinion. Um, but if anything, they tend to either weighted towards the more extreme end of that spectrum. So mm. uh, he has to continue to mollify them and give them what they want. He can't, um, he can't risk losing, losing them. So yeah, so how, how long? His natural tendency anyway, but he's just, but it's just his tendency is reinforced by that, that coalition that he needs to hold together. Mm. I just got a message from my buddy Dom that said, looking forward to what we have to say about the ICC court hearing. So Dom, there's another shout out for you. Okay. Um, how, long has B, how long has B.B. Netanyahu been in power? Because it seems like he's been there as long as I can remember. He's yeah, been around. Well, he's, you know, he hasn't been in uh, president continuously. Um, I don't know, but he's like over the last 20 years, he's, he's he, I know he hasn't been president all that time. Um, there was Ariel Sharon before him and I, you know, I just don't know. I, mm. But he's been okay. in power or close to, you know, or, uh, you know, he's been at the pinnacle of power. He's been president or nearly president for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think a lot of Americans, you know, we think of, uh, you know, we hear democracy and liberal democracy. We just kind of think about our system where we have these term limits, um, but it doesn't exist, uh, you know, in other countries, you know, necessarily. Um, they, you know, and, and I, the more I think about it, the more I feel like it makes sense to have one leader, as long as you have a good leader that can stay in power for a long period of time so they can actually enact long term policies. When I see our uh, government, everything's in four years. Everybody just scrambles to destroy as much as they can of what the predecessor did if he was a Republican <laughs> or a Democrat and then replace it. And then you just, you know, it's just such an inefficient cycle. Nothing can, there's uh, no long ability to, to plan long term in the United States with these short election cycles. Everything is geared towards the next election. That's all we care about. We pump things uh -huh. up and then um, it's a bad system. But um, I, I don't want to dive too far into that. I, uh -huh. But we can talk about just real quick that, you know, today is supposed to be Zelensky's last day in office right. um, as elections, but elections are suspended. And then that's why I asked that right. question. Is it is this common practice to just suspend elections in a democracy because of war? <laughs> right. Well, because I in think, my opinion, yeah. right, right. In my opinion, I think that the, the, in a democracy, the most important time to have elections is during war. This is something that is very important. Right. You want to reflect the will of the people, let the people say whether or not they want to continue this war, how they want the war to go, and elect right. somebody to, that expresses their wills, you know, their wishes. Um, right. But elections are suspended. So, you know, uh, Zelensky is very unpopular um, currently, from my understanding. Yeah. Uh, it seems like most Ukrainians do not want this war to continue. Um, but there's not going to be any elections. This war will continue. Um, uh -huh. And so the idea of saying that Ukraine is, is a fight for democracy seems to be, you know, dubious at best. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, like the, uh, the suspension of elections during wartime is, I think, just varies by country. So it, it is not... I don't think it's actually that unusual to have, you know, such a provision in your in a country's constitution. Um, now, I've actually heard that, yeah, that it, I think that that may it, that the Ukrainian constitution may in fact have such a provision, um, or at least you know it can be interpreted as as allowing the suspension of elections. So. You know, uh, none other than Aaron Maté, you know, who's no fan of. Zelensky says that okay, he he actually may be standing on solid ground here. Um, mm. You know, you couldn't really call this a coup. There, there may be, you know, at least there's some argument to be made for him suspending the elections and, and extending his term. Um, but yeah, I agree with what you said. You know, it seems like if there's there's some, no, nothing more important than a war, and if people, you know, this people is they're being conscripted forcefully into a war that it, it seems obvious they do not want to. Um, fight. I mean, they, I, I don't know if you've seen them, but there are these recently a whole spate of videos came out from Ukraine, you know, showing empty cities, deserted streets, and major cities of Ukraine. 
and it's just that uh, you know they the the men in particular are just do not want to get grabbed off the streets so they're mm-hmm. they're hiding in their homes or mm-hmm. um now i mean that you know that certainly seems to indicate a, a lack of popular support for a war and and it, it seems you know a, it seems like it, under these circumstances, you know, this is probably when an election is is needed more than any other time. What is this? What do you think will happen with Zelensky? You think that there's going to be that this is going to be, a, a, you know, I mean, you said that Aaron Maté, for example, says that he's standing on some solid ground, you know, to suspend yeah. elections. But if the war is so unpopular and people were saying, right. that, hey, we're supposed yeah, to have I mean, elections. It's just a legal idea... interpretation, but it's not safe to say that he has popular support. Yeah. Right. right. So do you, do you think yeah. that this will just kind of uh, further Zelensky's, you know, untimely demise? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, obviously, he's very unpopular. I can't, I think the, um, his, um, I think his support is down to something like 19% or what it is, you know, it's way down there. Um, and... And he has, a, you know, there in a growing restlessness that we've talked about, you know, uh, uh, among the among the soldiers. Um, you know, a lot of direct criticism of the government is, is being expressed on Telegram channels, and um, and then you know we also talked about the the various kind of uh, yeah mutinies, you know, the refusals to to take orders. Um, so yeah, you know, again, I think as we said earlier, yeah, there's there's a lot of there are a lot of things are 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 indicate uh, um, that uh, Zelensky's grasp on power, power is not very firm, and this is only going to you know make things more difficult for him, you know, because now people can can argue anyway; they can claim that he's no longer a legitimate legitimate president. Mm. And that, you know, so that before he could have said that, you know, it was easier for him to say that. It says, like, whatever you think of me, you, know, you elected me. And now people are, are going to think anyway, no, we didn't elect you. You were supposed to go by this time and you're still there. Right? Mm. You know, even yeah. if you can come up with a legal argument. I mean, it's just if, if you're unpopular and you've gone past your term limit, you know, it's just not good. It's, it just makes you all the more vulnerable. Mm. Yeah, Zelensky and Bibi, Bibi Netanyahu are both seem to be in getting in hotter, hotter waters. <laughs> that uh, do you think yeah. that both of them um, will be ousted at some point in the not too distant future? Like, what uh, what is the likelihood? Um, for yeah. me, it seems like Zelensky is more likely to go just because the war they're going to lose the war soon, and it, it seems pretty clear. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah. well, I mean, in the case of it, just seems like in the case of Zelensky, I mean, there's a real, there's always a chance of a, a coup. Uh, and apparently, there was an assassination temp, attempt recently. Um, you know, there's, the, you know, when you have, you know, it's one thing when the public hates you. Sometimes, you know, presidents don't care if they don't need to hold an election if the public hates them because, yes, yeah, so what? What are you going to do about it, huh? But when the army hates you, you know, you're in trouble. And and increasingly, it seems like the army hates Zelensky, especially since the um, the Sursky, General Sursky appointment. Um, you know, they they General Sursky is very unpopular, and Zelensky appointed him. And um, so I, you know, I think there's always a chance of a military coup there. That's I think that that I would expect to happen. You know, over the next next several months next few months Mm -hmm. um you know who knows maybe maybe he's he'll he's just very skilled at remaining in power and he'll he does seem to have the backing of the united states i mean again um anthony blinken was there recently you know strumming a guitar in the in that that basement bar but other but before that he was there you know essentially you know giving his support to zelensky Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, yeah. you know, that's significant, you know, when you have the Americans behind you, that gives you a lot of, a lot of power and it probably makes a lot of, you know, would be coup leaders reluctant to act. But did you, at some point, you, who knows, maybe the, the Americans will give a secret signal and say, we don't care anymore. You could take this guy out or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> right. Well, you, you said that there's, there's pressure from the U S trying to push 
Netanyahu out. You know, our U.S. support for Israel is still very strong. Yeah, well, but there's... yeah, right, right. We don't, you know, it's come from some quarters, you know, like Schumer. Um, hmm. I don't know that there's any evidence like that the Biden administration has done that. Now, Biden, you know, I understand uh, hates him, hates the guy as an individual. Um, but I don't know that he's, I, I, well, they did. Okay, it's true. I think they had Gantz, you know, was came to the U.S. and he was, you know, treated like, a, you know, a great celebrity. It was clear that they were making it, uh, making it known to to Israel and to others that they would prefer to have Gantz in charge. So and, they, you know. And I believe it was Defense Minister Gallant that recently said that he was going to resign if if uh, Netanyahu didn't kind of lay out a clear policy for Gaza by like June 8th or something like this. Did you hear about that? Do you think that's um, kind of done at the directive of the United States to kind of put pressure, you know, to say that you have three weeks to do this or that? And um, I don't know if you know anything about this, this yeah, situation. Actually, I really don't know anything about that. But it seems to me that, I, you know, the pressures um, in Israel are overwhelmingly domestic. You know, sure, it helps to have good relations with America. But like we've said, they, they simply, it seems like all around, they just take American support for granted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think maybe, you know, like in Ukraine, it's just a little bit, it's, they're not quite so sure about it. <laughs> so, yeah. you, you, you said Zelensky's popularity in Ukraine was around 19%. Do you have any idea what uh, Netanyahu's support currently is? It might is? be similar. He's, from what I understand, he's very unpopular. Um, a lot of people hate him, but it's not because of his war policy. It's yeah. not because of his conduct of the war. It's, I think, mostly they're maybe just sick of the guy. You know, he's just he's arrogant. He's and he's been in power for too long, and he's personally corrupt. I mean, that's what he's facing corruption charges, and that's one reason he has a personal, you know, reason to keep the war going and keep his coalition together, so that he doesn't fall out of power. Yeah, I, I you know, I just. When he said that this war could go on for another 10 years is what he's thinking, uh, oh. because it just shows that there's not really a clear policy. You see, you know, when you're fighting something like Hamas, it's like, well, you know, you're fighting an idea more than anything. You go in there and yeah. then, you know, who is Hamas? You know, they, they all they all Palestinians yeah. they are all Gazans. You can't really distinguish. Yeah. Um, right. Well, and, you know, and, there is a there is a Hamas, um, you know, organization and um but the problem is, is they're, you know, they're hiding underground and, and in the, you know, in the ruins and they're hard to find. You know, they, they've shown again and again that, uh, yeah, they can survive these attacks. Um, so it was what I think areas of northern Gaza were declared to be Hamas free a couple months ago. And, and then just recently Hamas has, you know, uh, carried out some ambushes there successfully. Uh, so cl clearly, you know, they never got rid of them. I just, I just can't believe that if you were an Israeli and you hear your president say this is going to go on for another ten years, that can't go over well. I mean, look, right. what's happened in the past six, seven months in Israel has been devastating for the state of Israel. You know, they're like we said, they're becoming a prior state. Global, uh, you know, popularity has plummeted. Their economy has suffered massively. Um, and so you just see, I just feel like they can't survive 10 years. This is unsustainable what they're doing in Gaza, right? It's, it's going to come to a, some type of head, right? And collapse. Do you uh, agree or? Well, yeah. Um, yeah. 10 years. I mean, it's, it's already taken a tremendous toll on the economy and, uh, 10 years would only add to that. And right. I, I, I just don't think that's sustainable. You know, unless I, I don't know, I know maybe, you know, maybe you could slow the war way down and <laughs> drop fewer bombs at a slower rate and call it, you know, call it a war and uh, just keep it going. I don't know. But uh, yeah, yeah, they, okay. again, it just seems like but in general, that's the problem. They just really haven't. Um, they don't seem to have an end game or if they do what their end game, they can't state it openly. And their end game is really just ethnic cleansing is to drive the, all the Palestinians out of Gaza. Um, but, you know, Egypt and is not cooperating with them in that. 
but we'll see. Um, I think that's what they want to do. You know, if, if they actually can drive them all out of Gaza, then they can just declare a victory. Because at that point, I suppose, you know, um, Hamas, you know, it has to has to leave with them. I, they could stay, but they could be starved out. Anybody that remains, well, yeah, I guess okay, you well, lose everything. You feel, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's just going to have to be a total, sol- you know, a final solution, you know, which is... Um, I, I, they're thinking of their own version of the final solution, and I, I mean, some of them are stating it openly. I mean, that's why we, got, why the uh, the ICJ had um, had grounds for for uh, uh, genocide. genocide charges against them, right? Okay, well, I'm not going to ask you what you think is going to happen because I do that every time. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll just yeah. we'll we'll just monitor you know, the situation. I don't know. So. Just, I'll just yeah, I'll just re- it, again. You know, you just don't see a way out of it. Like you could see how the Ukraine war could finally wind down and come to a stop at some point, and I think it will. Uh, but you just don't see how the how the, this war ends because it's you know the the only well right. I mean the the only solution for Israel, if you you look at their um, their current conduct and um, is is ethnic cleansing is to totally ethnic cleansing. but i i don't know if the world really you know the, the world's obviously angered you know the neighboring governments are uh you know though they've been allied with israel their their populations um have are become very restive and and i'm sure those governments are afraid about losing legitimacy and losing control uh they managed to hang on to control but if israel takes it too far they may lose control and they and egypt might you know might return to the muslim brotherhood or something similar could happen in jordan and then israel would be in real trouble yeah it's a lot harder to carry out a genocide in the 21st century when everyone's got mobile phones you know yeah. it's just live streams i just don't see how they can get away with it you know maybe 30 yeah, years well, ago not. i mean that's what it comes down to they're not Okay, Dad. Well, I think we'll end it here. Um, I'm going to go and celebrate my birthday. So um, thanks a lot. And yeah, we'll talk soon. Okay, bye-bye.